So, Cassio's just gone drunk to try and do his duty, and Iago takes some time to manipulate Montano's view of Cassio. So, Iago is damaging Cassio's reputation from behind the scenes. Um, and he says, you see this fellow that has gone before, he is a soldier fit to stand by Caesar. So, he's a fantastic soldier. Yeah, he could be Caesar's right-hand man. But he has a vice, a weakness. Um, and it's he says towards the bottom of that speech, I fear the trust Othello puts in him. It will shake this island. Now, you've got to remember that Montano doesn't know Cassio very well. He's just arrived on the island. And obviously, it's extremely ironic that Othello says... Sorry, that he says that he, he fears about the trust Othello has in him. Because, of course, it's his trust in Iago that is the problem. Cassio is, a, is extremely loyal to him. And Montano, you know, he, he, be, he believes him. He wants to know more about it. Well, is he often like this? Is he often drunk? Now, Montano would not know any difference because he's only just met the guy. So Iago tells an out-and-out -out lie. He says, "'Tis evermore the prologue to his sleep." So, as you know, a prologue comes before the play. So, his before... He goes to sleep, he's drinking, okay? And he'll stay up all night, he'll watch the horror lodge, a double set, if drink, rock not his cradle. It's a really, really nice metaphor. So if he can't get to sleep, say this image of a baby in a cradle who needs drink to rock him to sleep. Out and out lie. And the audience knows that. So you've got the brilliant setup here where we've watched Cassio and Iago and we've watched Cassio tell us how much he doesn't like drinking. Literally a few minutes later, we've got Iago Telemontano the exact opposite. So he's exploiting his dramatic irony here, Shakespeare, and it obviously makes us far more frustrated with Iago. Um, but it also impresses us. We're, we know we're watching a tragedy and we can watch this masterful manipulator at work and think, well, yeah, none of them have got a chance of surviving against him. Okay. Um, right. And Montano says, it were well the general were put in mind of it. So somebody needs to tell a fellow about this. Um, and then in comes Rodrigo. And Iago's like, what are you doing here? You should be going after Cassio, which is literally what he says. How now, Rodrigo? I pray you, after Lieutenant, go. And Lieutenant is obviously Cassio. So Rodrigo goes off again. And Montano calls, uh, says it's a great pity, pity sorry, that the noble Moor should, should hazard such a place as his own second with one of an ingraft infirmity. Infirmity, sorry. So actually, what we can see here is, again, another link to the theme of reputation. Noble Moor. So that is Othello's reputation, noble, again. But Montano's tone here is suggesting it's it's a bit of a pity. It's a bit, you know, that he's chosen basically an alcoholic as his second-hand man. So you could argue that he's all, Iago is also damaging Othello's reputation here because it takes maybe someone with a little bit, you know, lacking in sense to employ an alcoholic as a second-hand man. Okay. Um, now, Iago says, I'm not going to say anything to Othello. Not I, for this fair island. I'm not saying anything, even if you gave me the whole of Cyprus. He says, I do love, love Cassio well and would do much to cure him of this evil. Again, blatant lie. He doesn't love Cassio. He's using his pawn. It's a complete and utter fabrication anyway. And he's pretending he would like to help cure him in this alcohol problem that doesn't even exist. And here we have the fight. So Cassio comes in pursuing Rodrigo, which is the most important thing because obviously Rodrigo has done this on purpose. Iago's plan has happened just as he wanted it to. Um, Cassio shouts Zounds, which is the word that Iago uses in Act 1, Scene 1. So you could obviously say that that links the two characters together. Cassio is not himself now. Cassio's language has become closer to Iago's, it mir mirrors Iago's now. So in usually, Cassio's language is elevated, is better than, I than um, Iago. He's been brought down to his level, as I was saying in the previous video. He's, he's brought everyone down to where he likes to live in the dirt, in the, in the sort of the mess and the, the, the deceit. Uh, he calls him a rogue, he calls him a rascal. Montano gets involved. Now, Cassio reveals a little bit of immaturity here and it's because he's drunk obviously he says a knave teach me my duty so a knave is a sign of disrespect obviously if you think about the chessboard or if you think about sort of tears in the army a knave is just a common man 
And he's offended that Rodrigo, who is not as high up as him, has tried to sort of teach him manners. So now he wants to get his own back. So again, we've got this idea of pride. Cassio's pride has been injured by Rodrigo. And because he's drunk, he's going to act out on that and he's going to protect his pride. Now, you could argue in Act 3 that Othello's pride is another reason why he is so upset at the idea that Desdemona might cheat on him because she's damaged his pride. And you need to think carefully, I think, about the link between reputation and pride and actually how one, one is very much built on the other. When your reputation is good, you can feel proud of that. And a lot of people's pride, unfortunately, comes from how other people see them from the outside reputation and then but really a well-balanced mind should sort of feel pride based on what's going on inside them and who they really are inside uh, so back to the fight a bit philosophical there um, montano tries to stop the fight i pray you sir hold your hand and Cassio is not respectful to him. He says, let me, well, he says, sir, I suppose. Let me go, sir. I'll knock you over the mazard. Come, come, you're drunk. Drunk? And then he starts fighting with Montano. So from this moment on when Cassio arrives, he does do a lot of things wrong. Yeah, he's, his, his instinct to, um, you know, say, how dare Rodrigo speak to me like that is driven by pride. He, the fact that he is not listening to Montano, he's not listening to reason, that's also negative as well. So just bear in mind always that, yes, Iago is the catalyst, but actually it's a lot of just normal human flaws that everybody has that actually enables his plan to fully work. He's relying on, on, on these flaws and it's because he knows that people have them that he's so good at planning for them. He knows how to plan to manipulate them because he knows they exist. And he also knows that flaws usually win out over people's good qualities when there's a source of conflict or when there's doubt or when there's jealousy. So they fight and Iago is aside to Rodrigo, get out, get out, get out, go away because he does, obviously, we don't want you to be involved and he's going to go out and cry and say there's a riot. So Rodrigo, who's perhaps the only witness to how it all starts in terms of him provoking Cassio, is gone, out the way. And there he is, Iago shouting, waking everybody up, help, there's a fight going on, there's a fight going on. Okay. Um, and the bell rings, which then wakes up Othello. But before that, I think that's a lovely line, well, lovely in an ironic way, when Iago says, fee, fee, lieutenant, you'll be ashamed forever. And he will, and he is. He's ashamed of this action. He's ashamed in just like a ne the next page or the page after. He's actually devastated about his own actions. So again, Iago shows insight, and he's obviously pretending to care about him, um, when actually that's exactly what he wanted. So in come Othello, and remember, he's been interrupted from his marital bed. So kind of like if you, you know, if you want your mum to say yes to um, giving you extra money on a Friday, you're not going to preamble that with, you know, by annoying her. You know, don't, if you want, if you don't want Othello to come down hard on you, don't interrupt him when he's just gone to bed with his wife. So what is the matter here? He's fuming. Montano is bleeding. He's hurt to the death. I've been mortally wounded. And he actually says, I'll kill him. So it kind of highlights the severity of this fight. This is not just a, 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 a what's it called? Like a scuffle. This is like an actual hardcore fight. A fellow says, hold for your life. Stop right now. It's important you analyse the language, the, the exclamative and the imperative, the order, the command. He is in charge here. And it's a very short sentence. He needs one, two, three, four words, four words to stop everything. Um, Iago is his little um, like parrot stop 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 everybody what have you forgot all place of sense of duty he is loving this this is he's relishing in in basically the two of them per, per, performing in front of a fellow in the way that he wanted them to right a fellow wants to know where's this come from have we turned into Turks Right, he says, for Christian shame, put by this barbarous brawl. So if you look at the language, the Christian shame, barbarous brawl, he's basically emphasizing the consequences and like how terrible this situation is, that they shouldn't be behaving like this. Um, he basically says then, anybody who swings a sword now, you will die upon this motion. He dies upon this motion. So do not swing another sword. Now, this is a threat that Othello makes and you've got to assume that he would follow that through um, because, or uh, anyway, it doesn't matter because everybody respects him enough to not do that. 
Um, he says, silence the dreadful bell, turn the bell off. He's very much in control of this situation. He is master of this island. Um, and I think that's important because within the next act, we're going to see him completely fall into a hopeless mess. Um, ironically, in the last two lines of his speech, he says, honest Iago, that looks dead with grieving. So this is a way for the audience to learn. And obviously they'll see him on the stage. Iago is torn up. He looks like he's grieving about this. The perfect actor. And he asks Iago, who began it? You love me. On thy love, I charge thee to tell me. Um, and obviously Iago does not have any love for him. Iago pretends he doesn't know, which obviously he does know that Rodrigo is doing it. Um, but to be fair, he doesn't actually, you know, they came in and he, he, he's obviously got the cover story that he was with Montano. He describes the fight. They were tilting at one another's breast. They were in opposition, bloody. Uh, but he can't speak to the beginning. And Othello then turns to Cassio. How comes it, Michael? Are you thus forgot? I think it's important in that line, whether it's because he calls him Michael or whether it's just the way he's, are you thus forgot? There's a sense of disbelief there. Are you, are, you are, sorry, I just said the wrong way around then. You are just you've forgotten how to control yourself there's just i don't i feel like there's a real sense of disappointment there and that is perhaps one of the reasons why cassio just says i pray you pardon me i cannot speak and he can't defend himself because he knows he's let a fellow down now you can evaluate this and say that cassio lets himself down by not speaking and that you know he could have said here um i allowed iago to talk me into drinking but do you know what? I guess he's more he's got more honour than that. He's gonna take responsibility for his own actions. Um, at least to a to a point. Um, okay, so Othello then turns to Montano. He says, you know, you're supposed to be calm and collected if you look at the English version. You will want to be civil. You will want to be civil. The gravity and stillness of your youth the world have noted. So when you were young, you were famous for being calm, collected. Okay? Why are you now doing this? Why are you taking part in a night brawl? Montano says, worthy a fellow, I am hurt to danger. So Montano says that he's so hurt that we should ask Iago. So your officer Iago can inform you. So Montano gave, gives Iago power to convey what happened. Um, and a fellow says, now by heaven. So he's getting frustrated. He's like, for God's sake, will somebody just tell me what happened? Um, and... He's really not happy because they're all just sort of saying, oh, don't ask me, ask somebody else. Don't ask me, ask somebody else. Eventually, he just says, this is monstrous. So you can see he's really losing his cool. Iago, who began it? So a very straight, direct question targeted towards Iago. Um, now, Montano sets Iago up here to act like he's been really, uh, sorry, to sort of not lie. And obviously, the whole thing is a lie, but Montano's saying, if partially a find or leagued in office, thou dost deliver more or less than truth, you are no soldier. So if you lie here just to protect Cassio just because you like him, then you are no soldier. This gives Iago with the ability to basically dog Cassio in it and tell Othello that it was him who started it. Because, of course, we know that it was. Cassio would not calm down. Montano was completely innocent. So he Iago pretends like, oh, no, you know, touch me not so near. Please don't say something that's exactly what I'm thinking. And he says, I'd rather have this tongue cut from my mouth than it should do offence to Michael Cassio. So he's completely pretending here, wearing his masked face, pretending that he would rather have no tongue. He doesn't want to insult Cassio. Um, but I persuade myself to speak the truth. Yes, I'm sure he does. Yeah, I'm sure that he, he shall... Um, find it not difficult to speak the truth he says yes i persuade myself to speak the truth shall nothing wrong him so he's pretending that he's told himself that if i speak the truth cassio won't get into trouble which of course is a lie because cassio does get into trouble and there's no way that cassio could not get into trouble because of what he did um so he basically tells the st story of what happened uh, there was a fellow crying out for help cassio followed him with a sword um this gentleman stepped in so montano stepped in um, myself, the crying fellow, did pursue. Um, the town might fall in fright. I went out and started shouting. Um, and then 
basically the rest of the description of the fight. Um, when he came back, I found them close together at blow and thrust, even as again they were when you yourself did part them. No more than of this matter can I report, cannot I report. So he's basically saying, I, you know, when I came back, they were just as close as they are now. And I don't know anything else. I can't tell you anything else. Um, we then have, sorry, because my pages are in the wrong order. Iago then goes on to say, but men are men and the best sometimes forget. So um, that, that's a great line and it's a great thematic line to, to sort of this idea that all men are flawed and that fits really well in with with the tragic form which promotes this idea that we've all got flaws it's natural to have flaws sometimes we make mistakes but you've got to remember that the mistakes that these people have the flaws that they have shakespeare highlights to us that if you just have some a negative force like iago those small mistakes those small flaws can have massive consequences with the wrong person or the wrong motives in the mix Okay, and then, so Othello says, I know we are good that because you're so honest, you're, because you're making light of it to Cassio, you're trying to protect Cassio because you love Cassio. So, <sighs> Othello's come to the exact wrong conclusion, but... The, based on the evidence in front of him and how obviously well Iago has played this. Like if Iago had been, oh, Cassio started, it was all Cassio's fault. Othello might have been a bit more lenient with Cassio, but because we've got a man here, Iago, who's pretending to be like, oh, well, you know, I'm sure Cassio had his reasons, I'm sure, you know, he's such a nice guy. It's made Othello think, no, like stop making excuses for him. He's done something wrong here. So within just one sentence, one of the most important lines, Cassio, I love thee, but never more be officer of mine. Now, it's important when you think about the fact that we learn in the next scene, in, well, yeah, in Act 3, Scene 1 or 2 from Amelia, that a fellow's trying to get Cassio sent home, he's trying to look after them, he just can't reinstate him yet. But look at the wording here, never more be officer of mine. He's suggesting there that he will never work through Othello again. Now, this would destroy Cassio because he loves and honours Othello above all other people. Is Othello being rash here? Is he using the fact that he's been called out of bed, that he's... If you think about how difficult the conflict must be inside him to have to go from being with his wife and being all enamoured to suddenly having to be, like, put on his day stays job suit and go and be a general again and be masculine and being powerful and be in control perhaps he's rash perhaps the way he words this is what drives Cassio in Act 3 to behave so desperately because he feels like the punishment is is a life sentence because he says never more be officer of mine so it's important you get notes down around that given the consequences of this moment on the rest of the play and obviously the fact that he says I love thee there's definitely a love and respect there and then in comes Desdemona, and Othello's very upset about that. He says, look if my gentle love not to be raised up, I'll make thee an example. So again, we've got Othello here sort of make, suggest saying to Cassio, I'm going to make an example out of you because you have disturbed my wife. So he's mixing business and pleasure, and that is never to be, um, never a good idea. And obviously we'll see in Act 3 what happens when Desdemona does the same. And Desdemona's like, oh, what's the matter, dear? So calling him dear in front of when he's at work, a little bit undermining, you could argue. You shouldn't really be calling him in such a sweet way in front of his employees. He's got business to do, okay? And Diago, sorry, Othello, very importantly, does not tell Desdemona, does not involve her in front of all these people. He basically dismisses her by saying oh everything's well all's well sweeting so you've got this very sort of condescending um nickname for her sweeting sweetheart all's well don't you worry your little head about it so we can say here that we've got evidence that othello does not want to involve desdemona in his work affairs which then obviously gets him frustrated in act three when she insists on putting into his work affairs and he gives her an imperative, come away to bed, tries to get back into bed, and sir, for your hurt, myself will be your surgeon. Um, so basically, I'll make sure that you're looked after. And off goes Montano. 
So, ironically now, Othello decides to ask Iago to look after everybody, look after the town, make sure everyone's calm. And of course, Iago will go away and do that now because he's got exactly what he wanted. And he's, uh, Othello says to Desdemona, another imperative, come Desdemona. It is the soldier's life to have their balmy slumbers waked with strife. So lovely rhyming couplet there to end the scene. And it's the idea, unfortunately, this is my job, this is my life. Um, so you might want to think about long term how, if the marriage had survived, how Othello would have constantly been conflicted with these two demands on his time, um, how he might have felt like he wasn't being a good soldier by not being around as much, and how he thought might have feel like he wasn't being a good husband by having to work. Remember, if, he, if Othello had been there, instead of being in bed, it wouldn't have happened, you could argue. So off everybody goes, apart from Iago and Cassio, and this is where we have this big moment about reputation. And Iago says, are you hurt? And of course, Iago knows exactly that he's emotionally hurt, not that he's physically hurt. Um, and Cassio says, I'm past all surgery. But of course, again, Cassio is speaking metaphorically here. He's saying his heart can never be repaired. He's He's been broken. Um and there we have the repeti repetition of reputation, reputation, reputation. And the absolute despair in that exclamative, oh, I have lost my reputation. Think about the word lost there. He feels like a part of himself is gone. And the oh, just it's an expression of emotion, like he's expel expelling it from his body. He's lost the immortal part of himself. Now, it's immortal because his reputation will, what be, will be around when he's gone. And there's a focus on legacy, a focus on what will he become, how will he be remembered. Um, and he, because he's lost that, because he's lost that legacy and respect from the people around him, he thinks that what remains is bestial. Now, like an animal arguably then that's kind of how Iago sees himself he sees himself as this beast this sort of ruthless conniving person of the underworld who's sort of constantly trying to manipulate people and, and and spread discourse so again he's brought these people around him down to his level and poor Cassio is left feeling like an animal like he's got nothing left you might argue therefore that Shakespeare is suggesting the dangers of masculinity, the dangers of relying on your reputation for your sense of self-worth. Um, Iago says, as I am an honest man, ha ha ha, so irony again, um, I thought you meant that you had received some bodily wound. I thought you meant you'd been injured. Absolute rubbish. He knows exactly how, how, how he was feeling. Um, and then Iago says, reputation is idle and it's most false. It's often got without merit and it's often lost without deserving. So basically, stop trying to value reputation so much. Most people don't deserve the reputation or when they lose it, they don't deserve to lose it. You have lost no reputation at all unless you repute yourself such a loser. So basically, unless you think you've lost your reputation, you haven't. And in a way, he's got a really good point. Yeah, I'll go here. He's saying, look... Your reputation's only got only gone if you look at yourself differently. Like Iago would actually be quite a good motivational speaker. Like you can imagine on him on YouTube giving like self help advice because he's actually got a good point here. Like if you can look at yourself and see yourself in a positive light, then you're not a loser. Um, and then he says, but don't worry, there are ways to recover the general again. There are ways to get Othello back on side. So. When Iago says to Cassio, oh, you know, there's other ways you can get Othello back to change his mind, Cassio's really um, self-effacing here and he says, oh, you know, I'd rather not, like, I'd rather sue him to be despised, so I'd rather ask him to despise me than to deceive so good a commander with so slight, so drunken and so indiscreet an officer. So he's really... He's self-deprecating here. He's saying, oh, you know, I'm so bad. I'm so drunk. I'm such an indiscreet officer. Really, I don't want him. He doesn't deserve me. He doesn't deserve me anymore. And he, you can see him here giving himself a really bad time. A speak parrot and squabble and swagger and swear. He's really sort of torturing himself for the mistakes that he made. To the person who basically led him to make those mistakes. It's very, very dramatic. Great exploitation of the dramatic irony that Shakespeare's set up. And he then blames um, the alcohol. And he says, oh, 
basically invisible spirit of wine let us call thee devil um so iago says who was he that followed with your sword what had he done to you so he's checking iago here to see what cassio can remember about rodrigo and cassio's like oh, i don't know he can't remember okay which is obviously very very handy for iago because it protects he probably won't even be able to remember who rodrigo is um later on in in act five i'm pretty sure they come across each other um well they find him dead don't they um cassio says i remember a mass of things but nothing distinctly so this is how drunk he was um just a quarrel nothing important and again cassio is torturing himself about how they transform themselves into beasts that's interesting it's an interesting discussion about masculinity and men and this idea of sort of the pack and how they they all sort of you know well it took one man it took iago but they all drank to please each other to create this party atmosphere why did they need to do that why did they need to have to drink to make that happen and the elder says oh but you know you're well enough now how come you've sobered up so suddenly and cassio says it's because um the devil's wrath took over so his anger took over and that got rid of his devil devil drunkenness um and now he frankly despises himself he says one unperfectness unperf shows me another one so one weakness led to another if you look at the english version again cassio so self-aware of his own flaws it's it's actually quite insightful um the way he can look at himself but obviously he's torturing himself because of it and iago says you know oh come on you're too severe a moraler and i think what we can see here is having someone like iago around is bad like it basically if you were to follow your life by iago's morals then you would become quite a bad person but at the same time he's also around to sort of give people make them see reason and stop giving themselves such a hard time like rodrigo don't kill yourself you're an idiot um you know stop torturing yourself because you got drunk and made a mistake you know people do that all the time i mean i mean he did nearly kill someone but still so and again in a way iago does have some wisdom in the idea of just you know i suppose really it's quite a slithering idea just look after yourself stop stop torturing yourself you're still a good decent person um and because of that because he manages to get cassio to sort of think look you know you're not as bad as you think you are it then inspires cassio to think right yes i can ask for my place again yeah so iago as always has manipulated cassio into getting what he wants he wants cassio to fight for his job he wants cassio to go to desdemona so to do that he needed to get cassio to feel like he deserved the role and now he does i will ask him for my place again but he shall tell me i am drunkard okay um so he then returns again to the alcohol every inordinate cup is unblessed and the ingredient is a devil so basically he just keeps on blaming the alcohol when really he should be blaming himself uh which iago then says oh come on come on come on why good wine is a good familiar creature so iago is defending alcohol and perhaps you know the control that you lose when you drink it um okay and then he says i think you know i love you yeah you know that i'm your friend and cassio says well yes i know so ironic because he isn't There's actual annotations now um he says you and realize you can't see the left edge of them um i'll tell you what it says you are any man living may be drunk at a time man so basically get over it men drink so again very similar to the way he speaks to rodrigo uh, taking this uh, like tone of authority somebody who's an expert on how to live and he says i'll tell you what to do again like he does with rodrigo a general's wife is now the general so the implication there being as we spoke about in class desdemona now controls othello the general's wife desdemona is now the general she's in control in control and this is the excuse that iago uses for suggesting that cassio speaks to her so he tells her if you look at where i've circled there confess yourself freely to her go and speak to desdemona and this is of course every, this is what he's been leaning to he's already got his demotion which is what iago wanted out of the spite because he got promoted instead of him but now he's he's started phase two of his his plan which is obviously to to inf, inf, infect 
Desdemona and Othello's relationship. And then we've got this lovely description of Desdemona. She is of so free, so kind, so apt, so blessed a disposition. She holds it a vice in her goodness not to do, to do more than she is requested. Now, as you know, because we started at three, really, really true. Yep, Desdemona goes above and beyond. She does do more than she is requested. She nags and nags and nags. And that is because she is free, she's kind, and she's so blessed with a disposition, well, a kind disposition. So... Again, Iago shows superb insight into the people around him. He knows how to manipulate them. And of course, Cassio ironically says, you advise me well. Okay. Um, Iago says, I protest in the sincerity of love and honest kindness. Well, you know, I'm just helping you because I love you and I think you are fantastic. Dramatic irony. Cassio says, I think it freely and betimes uh, be in the morning, I will beseech the virtuous Desdemona. I will go and speak to Desdemona in the morning. He says, I am desperate. I'm just desperate. So this highlights how hard he's taken his demotion. And Ergo says, well, you're in the right. You've got every right to ask for help. Yeah, you're doing the right thing. Good night, Lieutenant. He still gives him his title of Lieutenant. He sort of emotionally manipulating him there and saying, oh, you know, let's just remind you of what you've lost a little bit. Uh, but I'll pretend to still respect you enough and, and show you as a Lieutenant. Uh, and Cassio says, good night, honest Diago. So again, it's repeated that he is honest um, for dramatic effect. Of course, Iago now is going to go to the watch because he's now replaced Cassio, as we'll have see confirmed in the morning. So we have then um, a final speech from Iago here. Um, he then says, you know, if you have a look at the English version, who can say I'm evil when my, voice, my advice is so good? I mean, he's kind of got a point. What's he that says I play the villain? Don't you dare accuse me of being a villain. I give good advice. This advice is free, I give, and it's honest. Okay. Uh, he then says, for it is most easy the inclining Desdemona to, to subdue in, an, in any honest suit. So it's easy to manipulate Desdemona. It's easy to get her to do something if it's something that's honest, something that's important, something that's, you know, is right, is morally right. She's framed as fruitful as the full free elements. She's she's just full of, of beautiful goodness. Um, okay, um, he then says, where well, they've next underlined, his soul is so infected to her love. And then if you have a look at the English version, he's enslaved by love. So it's this idea that Othello is enslaved by Desdemona. He's, he's enraptured with her and he can't really control his emotions anymore because of the love he has for Desdemona and this is the thing that he'll see uh, sorry he'll manipulate in the next act and at the la the back of the bot sorry at the bottom the bottom three lines nearly when devils will the blackest sins put on they do suggest at first with heavenly shows as I do now so the english version of that it's kind of in the middle of the paragraph when devils are about to commit their biggest sins they put on their most heavenly faces just like i'm doing now so it's interesting obviously because we've got the word the the um well it's the superlative blackest for sins so the darkest sins that people can have and <coughs> excuse me how when you perform your worst sins, you always put on a perfect face. You always have a heavenly face. So there's um, there's antithesis there between sins and heavenly, isn't there? And this idea that when people are doing really bad things, they put on a really, really good face. Um, so he's looking his best. This is what it says in the margin. Because he's doing his best work of evilness. So later on when he talks about how, how Cassio's beauty makes him ugly... You can argue that Iago feels at his most beautiful, at his most attractive when he's doing these most evil deeds. And of course, on a literal level, basically, that people, when they're doing really bad things, obviously hide it in the best way possible by looking, you know, beautiful and butter wouldn't melt. And he he basically then says what he's going to do to Iago, uh, to Othello. He says, I'll pour this pestilence into his ear. And that's a great metaphor because he obviously doesn't literally pour it, but he doesn't actually, uh, he does almost literally say it into his ear. Um, he'll say that she repels, she repeals him for her body's lust, that she lusts after Cassio and that's why she's um, appealing to Othello for help for Cassio. 
Um, and he says at the bottom two lines, I will turn her virtue into pitch and out of her own goodness make the net that shall enmesh them all. And just off the side there, it says, he will make her good intentions, Desdemona's beautiful goodness and her virtue, he will make them have bad consequences. He'll turn something that's negative, sorry, so positive and beautiful about Desdemona and he'll use it to enmesh them all. And that is a continuation of that metaphor of the spider in the web that he'll enmesh them all, he'll wrap them all up in his web. Um, and this links to Shakespeare's lesson that we can learn from the play, that good virtues can be easily exploited into creating bad things by bad people. And in comes Rodrigo. So he says he's fed up. So if you have a look where I've underlined, my money's almost spent. I've ran out of money. I've done what you asked me to do. Um, I'm going back to Venice. He wants to go home. I've not, I've not really got anything out of this at all. Okay. And then he persuades him to stay. He says, you need to have more patience. Um, Cassio has beaten you and you've got a small hurt. He's basically saying, oh, you know, Cassio's beating you up and now you're just like, oh, I want to go away again. Um, he, he doesn't even particularly use good arguments here. You can see that compared to the last time he tried to convince Rodrigo, which was like a full full speech, rep repeated lines, loads of different reasons to really manipulate him and appeal to loads of different things that Rodrigo cares about, he literally is just saying to him here, oh, go back, go to sleep. You'll understand later. And almost doesn't really sort of given the time of day and he doesn't have to because he's already done the hard work he's put in the groundwork he's got Rodrigo where he wants to he's just having a little bit of a, of a rebellion he can just put him back in his box he gives them in two orders he gives them two commands go where that I'll there are art billeted so go where you've been charged to sleep and get thee gone so very rude he's sort of again just I guess he's exposing more of his true self there. Rodrigo really should be affronted and should go home. But of course he doesn't. And Iago knows that he won't. So Iago plans live on stage again. He says two things are to be done. My wife must move for Cassio to her mistress. So I need to make sure that Amelia helps Cassio and Desdemona meet. And he tells her to do that, which of course she does. And the second thing is he's going to draw them more apart and bring him jump when he made Cassio find soliciting his wife. So he's going to take Othello away and then he's going to bring him in right at the moment where Cassio is soliciting his wife. So he's going to make Othello catch Desdemona and Cassio together, which, of course, is exactly what he does under the pretense that he's going to help Cassio by getting Othello out of his way. So that is the end of Act Two, where by the end of it, we have seen a full round of Iago. This is what I'm going to do. This is it's happening. And we can see we've learnt now from Act Two, Shakespeare effectively prepares us for the extent to which Iago's plans can go perfectly. So that we now feel like moving into Act Three, Othello really is um, ready to be captured in Iago's spider's web.